Hello, and welcome to the Nurse Linda webinar. It's the end of the month, so it's time for us to chat, and I hope you have a lot of questions today. I know we have some pre-submitted. First of all, I'd like to take a moment um, to thank everyone who puts on this webinar. You know, you see me sitting here, but there's a whole group of people that work very, very hard to make these webinars and to make them successful. So I'd like to thank that whole group of people and especially you, the audience that tunes in. So thank you everybody for all your help. I feel like I look so much better and do so much better, but I know it's because of all the support that I have when I do these. I wanted to highlight uh, today some of the things that's going on at the Reeve Foundation, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, um, because that you know, there's just always so many things going on, and we're doing a series of webinars with professional people in addition to these question webinars. They each have different purposes. So this is where we get to chat and talk about the things that um, are weighing on your mind. But every other month, I do a webinar where we have somebody who's top in the field of whatever their uh, discipline is, and uh, this. Uh, last September 13th, we had one with Dr. Raymond Anders, who does implants of diaphragm pacemakers. So for people who are on ventilators, if you want to get off the ventilator, if you want to improve your health, even if you've been on the ventilator for a number of years, adults and pediatrics, this diaphragm pacemaker is available, which can help you um, you know, a lot of people don't like that hard, rigid tube in their throat and, you know, the ventilator, they've got this big, heavy thing they have to bulk around and you have to have it because you have to breathe, right? And so this is a, a procedure that uh, Dr. Anders innovated where you don't have to have a fully uh, cut open abdomen and you don't have to have this major surgery. It's a minimally invasive surgery. They thread some wires into your abdomen and a little power pack, a little bit bigger than your telephone, runs your diaphragm to help you breathe. And so he's done patients that have been recently injured. He's done patients um, that have been injured for more than 20 years to improve their breathing function and to help them get off the diaphragm, or to get off the ventilator. Even if they can't get off the ventilator, he can certainly improve their uh, breathing condition. Now, this diaphragmatic pacer is available now. It's anybody can have it anywhere in the world, I guess. Definitely in the United States, and I know in other countries, and I'm just assuming in all countries. But anyway, you just need to um, talk to your healthcare professional about the diaphragmatic pacer, or you can call the University Hospitals at the Cleveland Medical Center and ask for information. It can be done locally. He educates um, uh, thoracic surgeons on how to insert the, uh, this uh, diaphragmatic pacer. Now, to me, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, that sounds very complicated. But, uh, you know, to, to people who do that kind of surgery, it's relatively simple surgery for them to do. And so this is like, it's like a really cool thing. So be sure and look back on that if you're interested in that, because it not only is more convenient, but it also helps you physiologically. And then for some people, when you have that diaphragm pacer working in your body, you know how I always say the nervous system wants to heal itself and repair itself. And so he's had some people that have had it and then have eventually learned to breathe without it just on their own. So it, it helps with that. It helps with reducing your risk of pneumonia. It helps with uh, getting the all those uh, chest uh, issues and physiological changes. So it, it really can be a lifesaver. And um, it's really quite a wonderful thing. So if you're interested in that, look on the YouTube and you'll see that um, this webinar of his, it was from September 13th, just a few weeks ago. And so it was really a fascinating, a fascinating program. Now we've had many other topics and we're still going uh, with many great topics yet to come. Um, we've had Dr. Kim Anderson Ertzman and Dr. Linda er Ehrlich-Jones that both talked about um, different things that they're doing more for the rehab professional side, but also as a consumer, 
you might be interested in those projects that they're doing. If Linda Ehrlich Jones is doing projects on keeping a database of all kinds of testing measures of what they do and why you would want to be have your progress uh, tested with some of these different measures and how they're used. So that's really more for professionals. But if you're having one of those tests and you're under, not understanding why, you can look it up on this um, web on her website and find out which. Um, why why they're doing what they're doing. Um, Dr. Kim Anderson um, has this program where she's chronicling the opinions of people who have spinal cord injury in particular. So she keeps this database. She's my go-to person if I'm looking for some kind of peculiar statistic that maybe is not out there, I can find out what's going on in the community. She's, she's my go-to person. We had Dr. Susan Grow, who's doing some phenomenal work in bladder. And we're going to be talking about bladder issues coming up. So if you have a bladder issue, you might want to listen to that in particular. Another feature that's available on the uh, web, uh, the Re Foundation website are these wallet cards. There are three different wallet cards. They're very nice. They're trifold. They're size of a dollar bill when they're folded up. One is on sepsis. One is on deep vein thrombosis. And one is on uh, autonomic dysreflexia. These are three big emergencies if you have any kind of paralysis. So they're good to print those off, have them handy, give them out like candy. They're free. Um, you can print off as many as you like. You can contact the foundation and you can get... Um, a pre-printed little cards if you prefer to do that, but they're at your fingertips on the computer. If you are going to the hospital and, you know, um, spinal cord injury and some neurological injuries, you go to the hospital and maybe people, the emergency room, maybe they haven't seen somebody like you for quite some time. Now, healthcare professionals are educated in all types of paralysis and the sources, but it's not every day that you see somebody with these conditions. So be sure and have that so you can cut right to the chase and say, I think I might be having this. Keep bringing up, I'm having autonomic dysreflexia. I might be having a clot in, in my leg or my arm. A lot of times people get clots up in their shoulders from hooking their arm around in their wheelchair, which kind of helps balance them sitting up. So it's a comfortable thing to do, but it's a dangerous thing to do. And so sometimes people don't think of blood clots that they might be in your underarm. So having that deep vein thrombosis card that you can put right out there. And then of course, sepsis is a very serious condition and it can it's an infection throughout the body usually comes if you had an infection maybe it's gone away maybe you're still treating that infection but it's all of a sudden instead of staying in the place where the infection has started it's traveled throughout your body and it's going through your major organs so people will start their workup healthcare professionals will start their workup with the simplest thing and then work their way up by the time they get up to the diagnosis of sepsis it's going to be pretty late. You need to start the treatment for sepsis right away. So in the world of sepsis, we always say, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. Everybody who comes into the room, I think I might be having sepsis. So they'll run the test right away and start treatment right away. So keep those handy. If you have somebody helping you in your home, if your child is going to school, be sure the teacher, the school nurse, anybody that's interacting with your child, be sure they have these, um, these wallet cards so that they can see that your child may be susceptible to this, or um, if you're an adult, just hand these out to everybody. So that, that helps get you the emergency treatments that you need. There's also on the uh, foundation uh, website, there's a uh, new information about emergency preparedness. And we've been talking about this. It seems to me like we talk about it all the time because it seems like every time we're having a webinar, there's been another huge climate disaster or fire or um, toxic chemical disaster someplace. And so be sure and look at that emergency preparedness. I think a lot of people prepare for what if what if the power goes out you know what do i do have you talked to your electrical provider to say you're on a ventilator at home or you have this equipment where you need electricity they put your name on a list so that they will be sure your house gets attention right away 
Um, so be, uh, you know, call your uh, paramedics and let them know that if something happens in your house, you're in there, you might not be able to get out on your own accord, you know, so make the people aware, but what people don't often think about is, okay, now there's been this disaster, there's been this storm, there's been this fire, something's happened. And then what people don't often think about is where am I going to sleep that night? Where am I going to sleep next week? If it's going to be several months until my house is ready again, what am I going to do for those several months time? So think about the emergency and what you need to do and think about what you're going to have to do in the bigger picture of things as well, because that's, that's, that's where I see people now they're pretty good at knowing what I should do for an emergency but what should I do in the long run? Where am I going to get a bed that works for me? Where am I going to get my pressure dispersing equipment? I can't go to the firehouse and sleep on a cot. I'll wake up and I'll have pressure injury all over me. So, you know, all these kind of things are things you need to think and plan for ahead of time. Now, another thing that I'm hearing a lot about is, um, uh, people who are looking for financial resources. So you can go on to the web on the Reed Foundation website, and there's a button there that will say Ask Nurse Linda. And you can ask me a question directly, and I answer every single one of them. So um, if you don't get an answer, something's happened electronically, um, but it, the process is pretty good. We were having some trouble, I think, earlier on, but the process is really very good now. So just um, press that button if you have something you know you want to ask privately or whatever you know it's it's just between you and me so um go ahead and use that button um but people are writing in a lot right now they're looking for resources financial resources maybe um they want a different catheter that their insurance doesn't pay for how can they get that catheter maybe they need um a ramp to go into their house or some home modification. A lot of people want a lot of this advanced advanced equipment and insurance won't pay for it. What do I do? How do I get it? Home modifications, a personal care attendant. How do I get funding for doing that? A lot of times insurance is not going to pay for a lot of these things that people really need um, to make their life better and to make their life safe. And so this is a real problem and um, you you can sign up on different organizations. Um, the Reed Foundation will send you a notice. If there's something going through Congress, don't ignore those, sign up for those, don't ignore those, sign the letter. They have a letter that's uh, written out for you. You just have to sign it. You put in your zip code and it'll say, here's your representative, here are your senators and that letter gets forwarded. Now look at the letter, make sure you know what you're signing, make sure you're in agreement. That's of course, that's always a must, but then add some personal message to it because there are people now, Does do your Congress people read these? They might read some of them, but their aide reads them. And sometimes people get put off. Oh, I don't wanna to talk to the aide. I wanna to talk to the, the main person. Never ignore the aid. The aid has the ear of the main person and they kind of collate all this information. And if you personalize this and make your story a part of this bigger picture, you can be an advocate for people with paralysis because that aid will read your story and say, Senator or Congressperson, this is a story of a real human being in your district of what's going on. And it makes it so much more real and they will bring that forward. So, you know, sometimes they might get a thousand letters and if they're all rubber stamped, well, they'll know there's a thousand people out there who think this is important and will sway how they vote, hopefully. Um, or they might, they might look at those and they might see some of the comments and that might ping in their brain about, oh, I see the connection, why this is so important for people. So that's in the bigger picture. But look at, and look at, um, there's a information that the Reed Foundation has on how to, how to find resources. There are organizations that help people as a whole, that help the population as a whole with paralysis. 
And there are some organizations that will help fund different things for individuals. However, you have to be careful with that because sometimes if you're on Medicare or you have a government payer and you get a big infusion of cash, say you do one of those um, things where you advocate your, for yourself and ask for funds on the internet, people send you money and now you can, you've got $50,000 to buy an FES bike or you've got money to buy a, um, a van, a wheelchair accessible van, be careful with that because if that money goes straight to you, it might work against your Medicaid payment. Might They might say, we've got $50,000, therefore we're going to take $50,000 out of your check. Ah, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That is, <laughs> that is something, you know, you don't want to happen. So be sure that you know how to look, look at these resources that um, you can you can find on the Reed Foundation that talks about all kinds of different resources. There's one organization, Help Hope Live, that that is um, they will help you market yourself. Um, that's consumer friendly. That speaks to different people. That you know they'll see your story and maybe um, help you. And then they handle the finances differently so that it doesn't affect your Medicaid. So there is a fee for that, but it comes out of the money raised. And some people know I want all my money, but if you pay a little bit for their services and you get what you need, it might be worth the money instead of trying to do this on your own. So um, these are some of the things. And then also at the ReFoundation, there are information specialists, and you'll see that is in your uh, webinar chat box there, how to get a hold of these people because they work on all kinds of funding issues with people. And so they're very helpful. Um, you know, there's blogs about if you, you know, if you have a catheter and you're getting infections, then how, how can I get a better catheter? You know, just because you see something on the computer or you see something advertised or your friend has something doesn't mean your insurance company is going to pay up front for that. Your insurance company pays for the policy that you bought. And if it doesn't include those things, they're probably not going to pay for it. But you can appeal. Um, there was a gentleman in the town where I live, and he was on the news. And I thought, oh, I wish you could go nationally. It's been several years ago. But he kept appealing for five years. And he finally got his FES bike that he wanted. But it was a lot of work getting there. So, you know, those are the kind of uh, things that um, the information specialist can help you work through that. Your healthcare professional can help you work through that. There's blogs about how you work through that. I wanted to mention another thing for those people who are looking for personal care attendance. Um, there is a new program uh, put out by the Kessler Foundation. I have a little card for them here. I'm just going to flash it up here. Um, but it's Understanding Spinal Cord Injury, a course for personal care assistance. So a lot of people write to me about they need to hire somebody and then they have a hard time because they think, a lot of people think that people in healthcare are going to know all about paralysis. And as I said, you know, you, you know, in nursing, I know recent, recently um, being a, a, working at a, in a school of nursing, there was a four hours in the med surge course on how to take care of people with paralysis. Now that's four hours out of a four year curriculum. So, so you know, for people, it's, if you don't see people who have spinal cord injury or neurological injury of any sort, it's kind of hard to remember all of that stuff that maybe you learned 10, 20 years ago. So this is a course about how to talk to people. Um, it's from the Kessler, um, the Kessler Foundation. And Kessler is a big rehabilitation hospital in New Jersey. It's actually where Christopher Reeve went for his rehabilitation. So it's a big, it's, they understand spinal cord injury and it's a training course. And it has a lot of interesting concepts. It has all kinds of things in it. So you can say, oh, you're my attendant. I'd like to, for you to attend this course. It's free. It's over the internet. You listen to videos and then it helps you understand more things like, why is it important for me to be on time? So, you know, sometimes people hire an attendant and then they show up late and then they, you know, they 
you know, oh, I can't come today at the last minute. And then there's the person who's hired them sitting there thinking, well, I, I have to have you here. You have to help me. Um, I need help doing things and I can't do these things by myself. So it explains why it's so important that the people are there, that they're on time, how you're really counting on these people to do things. It even goes into such things about, you know, if your person you're caring for says, I need to have my glass of water on my tray in this particular spot, be sure and have the glass of water on the tray in that particular spot because that's where they can reach it. Or, you know, this is why they have to have their catheterization done on this at this particular time. This is why the bowel program has to be done at this particular time. There's not a lot of variability in, in these things. So all important kinds of things. So there's a course and, the, and, you know, the person can listen to it. They can have that light bulb go on, out on and, and really help for them to understand uh, why things need to go that way. Okay, I'm going to read the link again. Um, it's https colon slash slash bit slash ly understanding SCI. That's what I have. Now, I, it says the link is not working, but the link worked for me just before we started. And I don't see where there's any difference in it. But if, if you want to um, contact the Kessler Foundation, um, you can you can type in uh, um, online uh, understanding spinal cord injury, a course for personal care assistance, and it, that will take it to you as well. So you can Google that, and that will that will get on. Now there was a question that came up um, about. Let me make sure I didn't miss one up above. Okay. So please discuss indwelling catheter, hard sedimentation, producing sand proteus colonization with proteus. The only solution being suprapubic, says Kaiser Urologist. Where can I get the best help if I don't want a suprapubic? Well, listen to Dr. Suzanne Groh's um, presentation, and then you'll get some ideas about uh, some ways to treat this, and then talk to your urologist. Now, you know, Dr. Suzanne Groh has not seen you or evaluated you, nor have I. So we don't know what the answer is for you in particular, but there's a lot of alternative treatments. Now, it could be that you're at the point where the suprapubic is going to be the answer for you, but there's a lot of things coming down the pike. And so, um, you know, sedimentation, uh, there's a lot of times people have sedimentation. You might also want to check into your bone density. Sometimes it's demineralization of bones and you see that. Sometimes it's just because people with uh, paralysis tend to sit or lay. And so the sediment, the sediment collects in their bladder where everybody has some set sediment, but you don't see it. Number one, because we're uh, toileting usually into white porcelain and sediment is usually white. So we don't usually see it. Plus it's not clumped together because when you're up moving around, it doesn't allow that sediment to kind of stagnate uh, and collect together. So everybody has it, but it might be to the point where you might need to be doing something else. So Dr. Suzanne, Hang on, we seem to have lost Linda for a moment. So I'm going to give her a chance to come back on. She's probably going to sign off and come back on. This is Julie, by the way, from the Reef Foundation. No worries, just hang in there. Hopefully, she'll log off and come back on. If not, we're going to give you 30 minutes back to your day. <laughs> Here she is. Welcome back, Linda. Oh, she left again. Oh, no. I'll give her another moment. Linda, we see you. Okay, I'm back. Okay, welcome back. 
Thank you. I'm sorry about that. I didn't know I was gone um, until I was gone. Um, so we were talking about sediment in the bladder. And so why uh, this person is having uh, the sediment in their bladder. And so um, not everybody who has sediment um, will need a suprapubic, but maybe in this particular case, since you're a urologist, uh, Kessler recommended that it might be the thing that is needed for you um, because the sediment has gotten to be so um, thick or so much. Uh, but anyway, uh, you'll get some ideas on some different treatments. You, if you listen to that professional webinar with Dr. Suzanne Grove from the National Rehabilitation Hospital. Now, somebody said, hold this up so we can get a screenshot of the, how you can, the course, for how to talk to healthcare professionals or uh, how, how to work with people, attendants. Okay, now I'll hold that up at the end again. So if you didn't get it, it's gonna come again. Um, oh, um, here's a, a question that came in. Are there any devices to stimulate the diaphragm to increase cough power? There is a thing called an encephalator. It's encephalator slash exephalator. And this thing really helps uh, to clear the airway. It works different than suctioning, but it can work in place of suctioning. And so that really helps to clear it out. It works in a little bit different way. It works on pressures that go in there. So, um, um, that is just another option. Now I see that um, somebody has written in, how long does it take to reply to an, an email? I've been waiting for over a month. I reply as I reply generally within the day that I get them, usually no more than 24 to 48 hours, depending on like if it's weekend or I'm out of town or something. And so, um, so if you've been waiting over a month, something has happened and it has not come to me. So what would you please resubmit that? Because I really, really... Uh, do want to answer your question. I, I in a month is out of the question. That's way too long. <laughs> I answer way before that. So if you haven't gotten one, uh, Stephanie, I'm I apologize for that. I don't know what's happened to your uh, message. So I will respond to you. I'll be looking for you. Um, here's a question that was written in about her husband. This woman's husband has had a wound for the last four years on his bottom. Why? Um, why are the last few millimeters taking so long to heal? Is there a different packing that I should be use, using? I'm tired of wound care and my husband is tired experiencing pain and discomfort. discomfort. Yes, four years is a long time. It takes a long time for wounds to heal. And if it's on his rear end where he's sitting, it sounds like it's on the sitting bones, on the ischium. So if it's taking a long term time to heal, it's probably because he's continuing to sit on it. So wounds heal faster when there's no pressure, which means no sitting or lying on that side. Since this has been going on for four years, there's probably some pressure, so it's very slow to heal. Now, um, talk with your wound care specialist, because if that last little bit is not healing up, we always want the skin, the outer layer of skin to heal the last, because we want the wound to heal from the inside to the outside of the skin. And the reason for that is because that's the way pressure injuries start. You know, a lot of people refer to a pressure injury like an iceberg. So if you see a change in pigmentation on your outside of your skin, the damage on the inside is much larger. So like an iceberg, you might see a little ice cap floating around in the water, but underneath the water, underneath the surface where you can't see, there's a huge sore in there. And so we always want that last bit of surface skin has to heal last. Otherwise, if there's still that, um, if there's still damage on the tissue inside the wound, then, um, and the skin heals over, there will, um, it will seal it up and infection could get in there that that damage in that uh, tissue is going to decay in there and it's going to make things much worse. It's, it's going to, once the heat, 
once the outer skin heals over, the inside's just going to fester inside and just keep growing and growing and growing and become a much worse. So that, that last little bit is the worst one. Um, sometimes people towards the end of the wound, they are packing them very tight to keep that wound open. And so sometimes a looser packing, but I would not recommend that without you talking to your wound care specialist to make sure that that is uh, what is needed. So there might be a different kind of packing that you might be able to use. Um, there's all kinds of different packing materials. There might, uh, they might want to put a wound vac on that. It's like a little vacuum cleaner that uh, attaches around the uh, area of the wound and sucks out all that decayed tissue. And then that keeps the wound clean. You don't have to change it every day. There is a machine that is attached to it and you can um, uh, fix the hose and fix the covering that goes over this so that um, the, the hose doesn't make more uh, decay in that wound. But be sure he's doing his pressure releases. Be sure he's on pressure dis dispersing equipment, medical grade equipment. These things are all very important to the wound healing. But it sounds like you're getting very close. And so this is this is actually a good news. So keep up with that because you're you're getting there. Um, a question, what are the top 10 places with respect to caregiving, money, support, accessibility, and nice weather in the United States? What about around the world? Well, that's an interesting question because um, people used to gravitate to the Sun Belt where the weather was nice all year round. Um, no snowstorms, um, um, no ice. Where I live, we have a lot more ice than snow. And um, so that makes going out in the wintertime very difficult. The temperature is so cold, you know, you get frostbite and all these different horrible things. So a lot of people used to make, live in the Sun Belt where the climate was more temperate. But now this, a lot of the Sun Belt has these huge horrific storms that are going on. So I don't know. Um, what is the best place? Um, as far as caregiving, it um, caregiving and financial support usually comes from Medicaid, which is run by each individual state. Therefore, um, how that money is distributed and the money that comes is, dict is dictated by each state. So, and it changes. So, you know, if a new a new state government comes in, they may up it, they may down it. Um, pediatric money for children is usually a bit more plentiful than it is for adults. But still, as you know, nobody's going to get um, a fortune uh, by living off those that money. So, uh, and then around the world, there are some places that have a really quite wonderful rehabilitation that is provided to the citizens, but you have to be a citizen that's injured in that country. Or if you're from like the United States, you would have to be like touring over there and get injured in that country. So it's very difficult. It's very difficult to move because sometimes your benefits don't change um, as quickly as you move. So if you move, you know, you're in this state one day and you move to that state another day, sometimes there's a waiting period before you can apply for the benefits in the new state, even though your benefits from the other state have stopped. So you have to check into all that. It's a very complicated procedure, but it's something, um, it's something to think about as far as that goes. Um, another question, what can, what can be, uh, doing to prevent UTIs? I have a super pubic catheter talking about our friend who doesn't want the super pubic about every six weeks. I seem to get a UTI. It seems like the people who get the chronic UTIs, urinary tract infection are people who have more trouble with their autonomic nervous system. That's the one, that's the part of the nervous system that acts autonomically. Automatically, it's the part that sends messages to the body. The body will sense an invader, a bacteria, a virus, a fungus. Um, it detects something in the body that shouldn't be there. And the body sends that message to the brain. The brain says, uh oh, activate uh, the immune system to get rid of that invader. And much as um, 
those people who have uh, paralysis from a head injury, from a stroke, from spinal cord injury, will have varying effects on their autonomic nervous system and how quickly that reacts or if it even reacts at all. So if you're having a lot of urinary tract infections, it's probably because of your autonomic nervous system. So improving your immune system by maintaining a healthy diet, drinking water, staying away from uh, things like um, uh, sugar, sugar drinks, uh, uh, candies, you know, um, stopping smoking, especially for people who have pressure injuries, because the nicotine grabs on to the where the oxygen model should mo molecules should be to go around in your body. So if nicotine is on that molecule, oxygen cannot enter your cells. The further your cells are away from your heart, like in your toes and your feet, your legs and your fingertips, um, that that's where you, it gets the least oxygen. By the time it gets there, the oxygen has all been used up. So it's real hard to heal wounds. It's real hard for your immune system to function if you have that nicotine glommed onto that. Now, some people will say, oh, I don't use nicotine. I vape or I chew. All that stuff has components in it that will rob your body of oxygen. So you need to um, stop all that. Now, I know I have vapors that tell me all the time, um, you know, um, I check with the company and there's nothing in that vape that is going to cause trouble. Well, check again and read the independent reports because yes, there's stuff in there that will, and it is addictive. And, um, you know, right now there's a big program with the teens and the vaping because they're, they're so addicted to it that they vape they have to stop and vape, stop and vape. And some people are just vaping all day long because they just crave it. Um, it's addictive. So, you know, if, if people say, oh, no, 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 it's not addictive. I one time had a person who said to me, oh, I, I'm using vape as a step down from cigarette smoking. So I've stopped cigarette smoking and I'm vaping just as an intermediary. And then I'm going to get off the vaping. And so I said, well, how long have you been vaping? Oh, for eight years now. Well, that's not a step down. That's addiction to vaping. So, you know, so you have to be careful about that thing. There is a lot of um, resources to help you stop cigarette smoking. Now, it is not easy. It's an addiction. Addictions are hard to break of any kind. You could be addicted to your electronics. You can be addicted to the TV. You know, you, you can be addicted to different personalities. You know, so addictions are hard to stop. And so that can be a bit of a, a challenge to stop smoking, but keep going keep going. Um, the uh, encephalator is I-N-S-U-F-F-L-A-T-O-R, I think. It's not E-N, it's I-N-S-F, like encep encephalating. Okay. I think that all came in while I was on my little hiatus in this um, information. So, oh, encephalator, yes look at there. Um, Beth's got it right on there. Okay. So here's somebody who um, uh, broke their neck in 1988. It's a C56 injury. They had a, C scat, a CT sc uh, CAT scan, which shows they have osteopenia and osteoarthritis. And my hips, I've been referred to an MRI for the back, even though I have no pain. Is there any point to that as what can it show me that I need to know? Well, osteopenia is the start of osteoporosis. And so you want to check the spine to make sure if you have osteopenia in your hips, you it's very likely you might have it also in your spine and they would want to know um, in case they need to do any kind of intervention for your spine, because you know, you can't have you don't want another spinal cord injury if those bones collapse, those vertebrae in your in your spine collapse. You know, that's going to be more of an issue for your spinal cord because you can have two spinal cord injuries and you can injure the lower spinal cord, even though you have a higher spinal cord injury. So um, it's you, you just want to check to make sure nothing's wrong. Now, one of the things that happens is as people don't put weight through their bones by standing or walking, the uh, calcium tends to leach out of the bones. 
it's osteoporosis, which we all know, you know, we think of the little old ladies with bent, bent over back and ladies get older, they get sometimes get osteoporosis. But people who have uh, spinal cord injury, brain injury, stroke, if they're not walking, they're not walking enough, you can get osteoporosis just from lack of the muscles pulling on the bones. That's what regenerates the bones and keeps the bones stronger. So moving your legs, moving your hips, exercising your muscles, getting into an exercise program. Now you don't want to do that with osteopenia unless you check with your doctor. You always want to check with your doctor before you start an exercise program to make sure you don't have a hidden blood clot that you could set loose, that you don't have osteopenia or osteoporosis, that you're going to start range of motion on your legs and they're going to snap and break. So you always need to check with your doctor to make sure. And then get a standing frame, ask your healthcare professional first if they would order a standing frame. So it, it blocks your knees, it blocks your hips, it will block your chest if you don't have trunk support that you can stand up in to put pr that pressure through those long bones of your body to help improve your osteopenia or osteoporosis. Now, what people often overlook is pediatric individuals who have spinal cord injury or some head injuries or neuromuscular disease can also have osteopenia or osteoporosis, and they can use a standing frame as well, but always check with your healthcare professional first. And then you need to have bone density testing. There's treatments for um, osteopenia if they need it. Um, if you need it. So all these things, you know, insurance companies generally will pay for a standing frame. Now, some of them are uh, kind of fancy and you can, they'll have like a reciprocal movement where they'll have something you can pull with your arms that will also move your legs. Now, some insurance will pay for that, some won't, but that gives that muscular pull on the legs. So that's, that's pretty, um, a pretty nice thing, which helps with those bones. Also, since it's in your hips, check with your um, your therapist, your healthcare professional to make sure your seating is correct, because we're finding a lot of people, not so much nowadays, I mean, in general, it's been found that some of the seating hasn't been quite right uh, for people, and so they've been having some uh, hip problems, but lately that's all been corrected with some of the newer seating and some um, better education that healthcare professionals have about hips in the seating and how important that is. It's not the matter of just sitting on a flat surface, but it's a matter of cradling those hip bones in that, in that seating uh, uh, position. Um, so here's a question. A person after they eat, their blood pressure drops to as low as 60 over the 40s. They've tried binders, compression socks, and smaller meals. The only relief is to lay down and taken a prescription medication to raise BP, but it has side effects like incontinence. Any ideas uh, for treatment? So um, you might want to talk to your doctor about um, the empty, that your gastric emptying. So something's going on with there. Either there's a lot of blood flow that's going to the stomach for some particular reason, or for some reason, sometimes um, the bowel slows. It uh, doesn't say that you have a spinal cord injury, but sometimes with neurological issues, sometimes the bowel gets um, really slow and doesn't empty and the stomach overstretches. So the body thinks that something's going on there. So it's sending its resources there. And so that's probably why that's happening. So I think that with um, some medication for emptying your stomach faster and your bowel faster maybe might be an option. So those are some of the things that I can think you're already doing the binders and, and the compression socks. The smaller meals will certainly help by not overstretching that stomach. And But I think, you know, talking about to your healthcare professional about if your gut is working fast enough, are you doing a bowel program that's cleaning out your bowel so that there's room for more uh, food to start moving through there? Or is it a situation... Uh, with uh, orthostatic hypotension, which is what's happening in with this pressure drop. And is there uh, some other kind of thing that can be done to help with that? Maybe a standing frame. It sounds kind of like, well, wait a minute, why would this help my stomach? But 
maybe um, standing while you're eating might help the food drop down through more quickly. It, standing can also help your bowel function or moving your legs, exercising your legs and your hips to get that blood circulating through your abdomen before you eat. Those are other options that might be helping. Um, there's, oh, there's another question about the super pubic tube. So a lot of people are, are getting this question about the super pubic tube. Um, they're use, also using a diaper with a super pubic tube. So if the super pubic tube is leaking, you need to check the dressing. And um, it, you shouldn't have to be wearing a diaper if you have a super pubic tube, because that should be catching. Uh, the urine should be coming out through the tube. Sometimes the uh, opening in the abdomen gets too large. And so you ne either need a larger super pubic tube or you need to have that little area uh, revised so that the opening is not so large because um, that shouldn't be leaking. There shouldn't be an, an open way for the urine to come out that way. There's a new catheter out that's called UR24 Technology External Catheter. And somebody says, have you heard about it? Well, I've heard about it. And I... I I'm not quite sure about what's going on with that. It's an it's a new catheter. Um, I I check the product information just to see what's going on. It serves as an external catheter, but temporary. It's for men, women, and pediatric individuals. Their information says it's for people who are incontinent or um, have trouble emptying their bladder. It's a very, it looks like, a, a, it looks like for men, it looks like a very thick uh, external catheter that, that you put on over the penis. The woman's is, is um, different, more like a pad that's inserted. Um, and then it catch, then it's hooked up to a suction machine. And the suction machine is actually turned up to quite a bit of power and it, it, they call it aspirating, which means taking fluid out of a part of the body. And so it aspirates out fluid, which means it's pulling urine out of the bladder. Now, it looks to me a lot like the pristine system where it just catches overflow or urinary incontinence. But they're advertising it particularly to people with spinal cord injury, but they do not mention neurogenic bladder. And that is a completely different thing than urinary incontinence. With spinal cord injury and lower motor neuron injury, people who have some brain injuries and some strokes, they have neurogenic bladder, as do people with spinal cord injury. So sometimes in spinal cord injury, when your bladder fills up, the internal sphincter will remain tight. That's the one that's controlled by your brain. You don't think about that opening or closing. Your brain does that work for you. There's an external sphincter that you can keep closed with pressure using your brain. Like if you have to go to the bathroom right now, but I it's the webinar, so I don't want to miss the webinar, so I can't get up and go to the bathroom, so I'll just hold the urine until I can get up and go. That's your external sphincter that's closing. The internal sphincter is going to work on its own accord. And so what happens in spinal cord injury is sometimes it gets out of sync. Uh, it usually opens naturally when your bladder gets to have a certain amount of pressure in it. But in spinal cord injury some and, and other neurological injuries, sometimes it gets out of coordination with your bladder and it tightens and it remains tight and it won't let the urine out. So there's only one, two other places where the urine can go, and that's in the ureters back up into the kidneys. The kidneys make urine, but they do not store one drop of urine. As soon as they make urine, it drops down in your kidneys and store it in the bladder where it can stretch and accommodate that. The kidneys do not stretch and accommodate urine. So if you're collecting, if you're not removing that urine from your bladder, it's going to back right up and it's gonna cause kidney damage. So that can be very, very dangerous. Now, the way that I presume, and I'm just presuming because I've not talked to anybody at the company to get the details for spinal cord injury. They have testimonial on their website from somebody who has a spinal cord injury and they said, oh, it's been a real game changer. Now you have to put this device on 
And it says it takes about 30 minutes to empty the bladder with this suctioning that's going to suck it out of the bladder. I have to wonder if the pressure can overcome the pressure in that uh, internal sphincter, if it causes damage to that, that I do not know. Um, then it takes 30 minutes to do it. And then you have to clean up all this. You have to wash all this equipment and use it over again, store it until it's time to use it over again. So all in all, it can take so it could take probably maybe even up to an hour to empty your bladder, as opposed to just slipping the catheter in. Now you don't have to use a catheter that goes inside your bladder, but it's going to take a lot of time. And if you're out someplace, are you going to you know you're going to have to carry around the suction device? You can wear it for a day or two, and it just is constant suctioning. But then you have to take it off for a while. It says nothing on their website that it's safe for neurogenic bladder. And that is the part that concerns me. If it's safe for neurogenic bladder, if it's been tested in neurogenic bladder, they should have that on there. So I would get more information before I did that. Now, it reminds me a lot of the pristine system, which was made for women, which is just a suction device that's worn um, it's actually slid up into the vagina. And as somebody is incontinent, it collects that urine. And that's what it sounds like to me, but maybe with a little bit more suction. But again, I'm not, you know, I, I haven't compared the products, apples to oranges, but that is not for neurogen. The pristine system is not for neurogenic bladder. And since it sounds so similar to that, until we get information about neurogenic bladder, that is that is the thing um, that that concerns me. So check with your healthcare professional to make sure um, that is um, that is what is uh, the appropriate thing for you. Okay, here's somebody who's uh, nothing's helping their spasticity. They do therapy twice a week. They had a baclofen pump. You know, spasticity is a good, bad story. Spasticity means there's some message that's getting through your spinal cord injury. So that's good news. There's some messages getting through, but they're not getting through correctly. Now, we all know that if you're living with spasticity, it's a nightmare. Spasticity is a good thing, but it's a nightmare to live with. So check with your healthcare professional because if you have a baclofen pump, it's probably time maybe to have that adjusted, maybe to have that um, increased or to have some other medication that's uh, put in there to help with that um, spasticity. So it's time, you know, spasticity is ever evolving. And you need to have changes in your medication at different points in time. And it sounds like that is the time for that to be adjusted. Here's another question about nerve pain getting progressively worse. So get it's like the spasticity. Nerve pain means some message getting through. It's a great thing to have happen, but it's a miserable thing to, to, um, to live with. So nerve pain, neuropathic pain, changes all the time. Sometimes it gets worse and sometimes it gets better. Sometimes people will change their medication and they'll go on to a different, uh, they'll want to try a different uh, medication for their neuropathic pain. But when they, you can't be on two medications at once. So you can't be going off one and going, starting another one. So you have to go completely off the one before you start the next one. But when they go off the medicine that they're on, they'll find their pain doesn't, it's just not there anymore. It's just gone. So the body has learned through that medication, the nervous system's always trying to heal itself and the body has learned, we don't want that message doing that anymore. So there are medications for neuropathic pain. There's uh, gabapentin and Lyrica are their trade names. And uh, they were both developed to treat neuropathic pain. Now, some people don't want to go on those uh, medications. They're pretty significant medications. So some people want to start out with something uh, lower. So you can take a low dose of an antidepressant or anti-seizure medication. They are very low doses where like if you're on an antidepressant, you might take 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams. But for neuropathic pain, you might be taking like 10 milligrams. It's an interesting thing that people who have uh, depression and take 
medicine for depression generally don't have neuropathic pain because that, that a side effect of depression medication is treating neuropathic pain. Same thing for people with seizures. So those medications use in very small doses will help with that um, nerve pain. But yes, it does change over time. It changes and evolves. And so you constantly have to be going up on your medication. You might want to try, you know, the Neurontin or um, Lyrica medication because it's it's more powerful. Um, but you have to keep going up on those medications to um, control that over time. Uh, is there something to recommend to have on hand for uh, 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 skin care, sore relief, that kind of thing? Um, really, um, there's no ointment treatment that will prevent a pressure injury. What prevents pressure injury is doing your pressure releases and using medical grade pressure dispersing equipment. Um, it's very important. Those are the things. They reduce your risk. They, nothing can eliminate your risk because we are all moving thousands of times in the day, Th thousands of little tiny movements when we breathe our bodies moving. And that's letting the circulation, um, those little tiny capillaries in our body is letting the blood flow through differently. So when I lay down in bed, I don't have mobility problems, but when I lay down in bed, I'm cutting off some of my circulation to the cap capillaries, but you know, we're always twitching, moving, we roll over, we do different things. And that's why we don't get pressure injury. But when you don't get that message that you need to twitch or move, you know, so your brain's, you don't even mentally think about it. Your brain just does it for you. It's that autonomic nervous system again. So there's um, emollients you can put on your skin. You want to keep your skin well hydrated. You want a healthy diet no smoking. You want the oxygen to get to your skin. Um, and doing those things will help keep your skin healthy. Now, there are some people that like different products. Um, I've been hearing a lot about Noop, N-O-O-P, that people are swearing by. What works for one person does not work for another person. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the internet that's geared for this, that's helped different people. But you know, really the thing that's going to help your skin is to do your pressure releases, be on the pressure dispersing equipment, don't smoke, drink fluid, water is the best. That's really what's going to happen. Um, info about SEI help in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, there are different organizations. I think the Reef Foundation has a California chapter. Um so I'm going to rely on the information specialist. Uh, Beth is, um, might have information about that. Um, also, be sure and uh, talk to, look up the mentors at the Reef Foundation because they are people who have spinal cord injury and, oh, they have a California state resource document. So there you go. Um, but look up the mentoring program because they will have people in your area that you can connect with and they'll have information about here's a really good doctor. Hey, here's an accessible dentist. Uh, you want to go to this particular concert or something. Here's the best way to get in. They just have all kinds of things. They've been through it. They've done it. They really know what's going on. Um, uh, uh, differences. Um, with a medical Medicare Advantage plan or Medicare, Medicare supplement insurance and drug plans, those you need to um, talk to someone in your uh, state. There are people that will work for free. Well, they represent um, different organizations, but they're brokers and they get their payment from whoever you sign up with. So you don't necessarily pay for their services, but they or you can call the different uh, companies and say, I'm on these medications. And they'll say, well, that's best covered by this policy. Now, I will tell you the Mer Medicare Advantage plans are having legal action taken against them right now. I don't know all the details. I don't know what's going on specifically with it. But they're still heavily advertised on TV because you're going to get all this stuff for free. And what it is, is that they're um, catering to people who don't have a lot of resources, but they don't provide the services that the other companies do. They provide a lot of preventive care, but should something happen, then it's a little more difficult. You have to sometimes see certain providers. I There's a lot of 
information and misinformation, I don't want to give any misinformation. I will just say they're under a legal review and there's a law case, a, a suit against the Medicare Advantage plan. So that might be something you might want to think twice about there. Um, let's see, there's some more questions here. We're coming up to the end of the time. Um, there's a person that says that their bladder only holds 30 cc's. What can I do about this? The 10 year years of indwelling catheter caused this. Yes, your, your bladder is a muscle and it has tightened. It shrank because it wasn't being exercised by being filled and emptied, filled and emptied. If our bladder isn't filled and empty, it's a muscle. Muscles contract and it tightens, but it can be exercised and brought back. So talk to your healthcare professional because um, there are ways that you can clamp the catheter only for so long. You need a plan individualized for you that will help stretch out your bladder again. So that it is possible to do this, but you need a plan specifically designed for you and your bladder. You can't just clamp it off for the day because that muscle is tight and where's that fluid gonna go into your kidneys and you'll have kidney damage. So you have to have somebody who knows what they're doing. Your healthcare professional will know how to do this. And yes, you can restretch your bladder. So on that note, I'm going to hold up, get out your, your cameras. Gonna, I'm going to hold out this, um, this form for enrolling for this program for personal care assistance. And I'm also writing a blog about this. So you'll see this next month coming out in the blog. And we'll have a little bit more information. But... Um, I'm going to hold up this card again. If you want to search under, if you want to Google understanding spinal cord injury, a course for personal care assistance, that takes you there. But also this link right here. Now let me hold it still. I hope I'm holding it still enough. Wait a minute. Let me there support that elbow. Let me put that up there for a little while and you can go back and look at this on uh, the replay, and you can be able to get this again. Hi, Linda. I just put the link right into the chat for it, so no one needs to worry about the All QR right. code. All right, good, because I don't know my hands were steady enough. So anyway, okay, hopefully a good thing. Hopefully, it seems like people are interested in this Um uh, course for personal care assistance. I've seen pieces of it and oh my goodness, let me tell you, it looks fabulous. And um, uh, I know the people who developed it and the people at the Kessler Foundation and they're fabulous. They know what they're talking about. And I, so I think that, um, you know, much like the Christopher and Dana Reeve uh, Foundation, they know what they're talking about there. Be sure if you have any questions, either to contact me or don't forget those information specialists. You can contact them directly and they have a lot of information at their fingertips about resources. So if you're looking for that and a, and a variety of other things, they know everything. They're really fabulous. So each and every one of them. So um, I look forward to seeing you again next month. This has been an interesting conversation today and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for tuning in.